Through 103 years of Notre Dame football, taking on top-ranked opponents from one end of the country to the other has been the rule rather than the exception. When Newt Rockney played for the Fighting Irish in 1913, Notre Dame first traveled to West Point to battle powerful Army. That inaugural game set the stage for a series of memorable matchups between the Irish and the Cadets in Yankee Stadium in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Rockney coached at Notre Dame in 1926 when the Irish first traveled to Los Angeles to take on USC. And that began a series that has become one of the great intersectional rivalries in college football history. But even the legendary Rockney probably did not envision the challenge placed in the hands of Notre Dame coach Lou Holtz in 1989. Confronting a back-breaking schedule that included eight road games played from New York to California, the Fighting Irish took on all comers. The 1927 New York Yankees lineup, led by Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, came to be known as Murderer's Row. But the list of teams facing Holtz and the Irish in 89 was no less awe-inspiring. This is Casey Kasem bringing you the top college football hits from coast to coast for 1989. And the team that played the best of the best in 89. It was the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. They played nine bowl teams, eight teams that ranked in the final AP Top 25, and five teams that played on January 1st. From that kickoff classic against Virginia, all the way to that rockin' evening in the Orange Bowl against top-ranked Colorado, with Michigan, USC, Penn State, Miami, and all the rest in between, Notre Dame beat the best that college football had to offer in 89, becoming only the second team in history to win 12 games in two straight seasons. The Irish did it by taking their show on the road for all all but five home games, and they did it with all that went with being the top-ranked team in the land. The number one team on the charts for 12 straight weeks in 1989, it's Lou Holtz, Fighting Irish. Irish fans might have thought they had seen it all when Notre Dame left the Fiesta Bowl with the national crown in 1988. But 1989, with all its challenges and expectations, proved to be just as much of a storybook season. Notre Dame's traveling gridiron group opened its 89 road show in the kickoff classic in the New Jersey Meadowlands against ACC Power Virginia. Watching were more than 77,000 fans, the most ever for a college game at Giant Stadium. It marked a dazzling opening act for junior All-America cornerback Todd Light as the Irish picked up right where they had left off in winning 12 straight games the previous year. The first ball game of the season is always very exciting. Uh, we played the University of Virginia, you know, which is a great powerhouse in the ACC. I was fortunate enough to come with the interception on third play of the season to set up the uh, first Irish score. We played mistake-free football the first half, and we were doing really well. The interception of Sean Moore's first pass set up the Irish and Virginia's 31. And five running plays later, 
junior tailback Ricky Waters took a pitch from senior quarterback Tony Rice for the final two yards. After Notre Dame held the Cavaliers without a first down, the dominating Irish ground attack took command. Eilers wide left as the flanker, double tight end, I can this time, handoff Johnson, he dives over into the end zone, touchdown, 57 yards, 9 plays, and Notre Dame has a 13-0 lead. Waters returned the first Virginia punt for 24 yards, and his second run back for 37, put the Irish in business at their own 46. Rice's first pass of the night covered 52 yards to sophomore Ragib Ismail. And sophomore fullback Rodney Culver's two-yard slant made it 19-0 before the first period was finished. The second quarter was no different than the first. Expertly mixing the run with the pass, Rice created big gains on three key downs. Johnson's second short touchdown burst made it 26 to nothing. Wishbone backfield, end off to Anthony Johnson, forget it, in standing up, touchdown. Notre Dame scored on its fifth straight possession on the strength of its quarterback's arm, as Rice fired to Ismail for 26 yards, and to Waters for 30 more. This time, Rice kept it himself for the touchdown that made it 33 to nothing with more than five minutes still remaining in the first half. Junior linebacker Don Grimm's interception further frustrated Virginia as the Irish ended up with a first half advantage of 16 to three in first downs and 333 to 60 in total yards. The Irish proved they were human in the second half, giving up two touchdowns on fourth down passes and even fumbling the ball away once. But Light served notice that he'd be one of the best in 89, blocking a putt in the third period and intercepting a second pass in the final two minutes of the 36-13 opening victory. Tony Rice earned the media's vote for game MVP. Waters finished with 189 all-purpose yards, and Ismail had a career-high 121 receiving yards. Notre Dame finished with an even 300 yards rushing. Against a Virginia team that won 10 of its next 11 games in the ACC title, as well as a Citrus Bowl berth, the opening Irish effort earned passing marks from Lou Holtz. It was the first step of what would prove to be a long journey for Notre Dame in 1989. The steps that Ragib Ismail took two and a half weeks later in Michigan Stadium proved as memorable as those taken by any Irish player all year. In particular, it was his two kickoff returns for touchdowns that broke records as well as the backs of the second-ranked Wolverines. Before the game in the locker room, Coach Jay Hayes, who was the coach of special teams, he came up to me and it was not very good weather outside. And he told me, you know, Rock, this is going to be just like the Rice game. And I was like, really? He said, yeah, because I have a feeling that we're going to return two kickoffs. And I looked at him like, yeah, okay. Lo and behold, after the game was over, he came up to me and he was like a prop. He was like, what did I tell you? I was like, yeah, you were right. <laughs> in the rain, both coaches played it close to the vest in the 25th game in history between the nation's numbers one and two teams. Other than an early missed field goal by Notre Dame, the two teams traded punts on their first half dozen possessions. Not until Don Grimm forced Michigan's Michael Taylor to fumble and junior defensive end Scott Kowalkowski recovered at the Wolverine 24, did anyone threaten again? With Anthony Johnson bullying his way for 17 yards while carrying on four of the first five plays, the Irish pushed their way to the two. Following a motion penalty, it was Tony Rice's only pass completion of the day, a six-yarder to Johnson that put Notre Dame on top seven to nothing. Michigan nearly evened it up on a perfect Taylor pass to Chris Callaway in the final minute of the half but the conversion kick hit the upright. Notre Dame had won the toss to start the game and deferred until the second half. And that decision looked huge as the rocket blasted off for 89 yards to open the third period. This field down around the five yard line. The kick will come down and Ragib will take it. Takes it at the 12, 15, 20, 25. He's at the 30, after burners are on. He's gone, 40, 45, 50, down the sideline, at the 35, a right to the goal line, at the 10, the five, a touchdown, Irish. 
The game took another swing on the following series when senior linebacker Ned Bolkar, who finished with 19 tackles, collided with Taylor on a third down attempt. That sent Taylor to the sidelines and brought on redshirt freshman Elvis Gerback, a highly regarded passer who had never played a down in a Michigan uniform. Trailing 17-6 after a 30-yard field goal by freshman Craig Hendrick, Gerback set about putting his team back in contention. Completing six of seven passes on a 61-yard drive, Gerback connected with teammate Derek Walker two minutes into the final quarter to pull Michigan within 17-12. Then, Ismail did his trick for the second time. And the Rockets back for it. He's at the 9, to the 10. Gets to the 15, the 20, 25. Out of the pack, 30, 35. Goodbye, baby! At the 50, the 40, the 30, the 20, the 10. Bye, bye, Rocket touchdown, Irish! It was the first time any player had returned even one kickoff for a touchdown against a Michigan team in 32 years. And it effectively squashed what momentum Michigan had built up. Gerbach came back two series later to throw another touchdown pass to make it 24-19 with four minutes left. But the Irish recovered the onside kick and then got a critical fourth down conversion run by Anthony Johnson to let the Irish run out the clock. Johnson led the Irish with 80 rushing yards as Notre Dame rolled up a 213-94 yard advantage in that category despite the Wolverines' gargantuan offensive line. It was a satisfying victory for the Irish, who became the first team to defeat a Bo Schembechler coach Michigan team three straight years. And it came against a Wolverine team that won its next ten games and claimed a second straight Big Ten title. With the Irish in the midst of a two-season stretch that saw them play seven of eight games on the road, Notre Dame's only home field appearance in the first six games of 89 came against Michigan State. For Irish players as well as their ardent fans, an afternoon at Notre Dame Stadium is what college football memories are made of. The Irish fans enjoyed the color and pageantry of an autumn afternoon in picturesque Notre Dame Stadium. Ricky Waters was pacing Notre Dame's ground attack against the Spartans with 89 yards and two touchdown runs. But his memories of that contest revolved around the physical nature of the matchup. Coming into the Michigan State game, we knew that we were in for a hard-hitting game and it was going to be a war. And it turned out to be even more than we expected because they came in and they hit very hard and they were playing of great tenacity on defense. They were led by Percy Snow, who we felt was one of the best linebackers and proved to be throughout the year, and they really came hard. The Irish had things all their own way early, using two drives of 70-plus yards to grab a 14-0 advantage midway through the second period. With Tony Rice mixing his calls expertly, Notre Dame used 14 plays once, culminated by Waters' short dash to the corner, then used the big play from Waters to stick the Irish to a two-touchdown advantage. Meanwhile, the Notre Dame defense was doing its part. In fact, it was only because of two late Irish turnovers that the Spartans got in position for two field goals in the final three minutes of the second period.
Michigan State wasted little time evening things up after halftime. Denied once on an acrobatic interception by Todd Light, the Spartans came right back after a third Notre Dame mistake and a picture-perfect scoring throw by Dan Enos. Then the two defenses took over. With All-Americans Chris Zorich of Notre Dame and Percy Snow of Michigan State making their presence felt, neither team could generate any steam on offense. The pendulum swung Notre Dame's way on a Don Grimm interception. But it went right back when the Spartans stripped the football away. Finally, the Irish ground game got results getting four big gainers from Waters, Rice and Anthony Johnson, Notre Dame methodically worked its way toward the goal line, where Johnson hurdled the final yard for a 21-13 lead. Double tight end, Eilers at left halfback, Johnson the fullback, Ricky Waters at right halfback, Tony Rice the quarterback, takes the snap on the option, running it, no, he did give it to Anthony Johnson, breaks the plane of the goal line for a touchdown. Finally, it was up to the defense one last time. The visitors march patiently into Irish territory, but on fourth and one from the Notre Dame 25, the Irish stop Michigan State's Highland Hickson short of the marker, and Notre Dame's third triumph of the young season was preserved over a Michigan State team that ended up winning its last eight games, finishing 16th in the final poll. But with three straight road contests staring them in the face, the Irish had little time to celebrate. A visit to West Lafayette to battle old nemesis Purdue turned out to be just what Tony Rice needed to air out his passing arm. It also turned out to be a spectacular day for the Notre Dame defense, which came within a whisker of shutting out the Boilermakers. Senior defensive tackle Jeff Alm remembers the feeling. Looking back on the Purdue game, I think uh, Coach Alvarez and Coach Palermo helped us the most. They seemed to have us keyed in on all of the Purdue offensive strategies, and we knew exactly what they were going to throw against us. Luckily for us, Tony had a really good day throwing the ball and we managed to run the ball really well also. The, we created something like five turnovers in the first half alone and I even managed to grab a ball and run it back for a 16 yard touchdown. Um, we knew they were a passing team and we came out prepared to deal with it. Purdue fumbled the ball away on its second possession with senior cornerback Stan Smigala recovering. Three plays later, Rice hit wide open sophomore tight end Derek Brown for 27 on the first of his career-high four receptions. One play later, Anthony Johnson made it 7-0, and that's how it went all day for the Boilermakers. The Irish even got a touchdown after an interception from Alm, who tied for the team lead in that category as a junior. Todd Light and senior free safety Pat Terrell also pulled down interceptions in the first half, and Terrell's interception prompted an 80-yard drive for a score with a Rice to Brown play counting 38 of the yards. Then in the final three minutes of the half, Notre Dame marched 97 yards, getting nearly half that on a Rice toss to Ragib Ismail. Chris Zorich's fumble recovery ended the first half with the Irish leading 34 to nothing. Notre Dame had totaled 344 yards in the first two periods and scored in all but two opportunities. The Irish enjoyed a much-needed chance to play the second and third teamers after intermission, with a pair of Craig Hentrick field goals finishing the Irish scoring. Purdue managed to avoid the shutout only on a scoring throw with 33 seconds remaining. Rice finished with a career-high 12 completions and 15 attempts for a career-high 270 yards in the 40-7 win, as the top-ranked Irish rolled to their 16th straight win. The renewal of the Stanford series brought back memories of the Rose Bowl matchup between the Four Horsemen and the great Ernie Nevers, as Notre Dame made its first visit to Palo Alto in 26 years. In Stanford Stadium, the Cardinal threw everything at the Irish but the kitchen sink. Literally. Stanford was a game I'll never forget. Uh, we went out there, it was 85 degree weather uh, after playing in South Bend and, and Midwestern uh, colleges. 
Uh, the weather change was definitely a factor. Uh, as far as the secondary goes, we were out there, they threw the ball an unbelievable amount of times. Uh, we definitely had our work cut out for us. Stanford had a great team and they had a great game plan for us. Fortunately, we came out on top. The first four possessions combined did not produce a first down until Stanford quarterback Steve Smith began his record-setting passing assault by completing seven throws in a 14-play excursion that led to a 34-yard field goal. In fact, it wasn't until the Cardinal had added a second field goal for a 6-0 lead that Notre Dame finally managed its initial first down late in the first period on a 30-yard throw from Tony Rice to Regitta Smile. The Irish required just over a minute to get the lead back. Anthony Johnson's first down attempt for 25 was followed one play later by Rice's keeper for 38. Johnson went left for the final seven yards in a 7-6 lead. A 20-yard return on an interception by senior strong safety Dewan Francisco put the visitors in prime position at the Stanford 30, and Rice went to work. He zeroed in on Ismail for 14 yards on third down, then converted himself on fourth and one before Rodney Culver took a pitch out to make it 14-6. But the Cardinal wasn't finished yet. After holding the Irish to start the second half, Stanford promptly marched 79 yards to narrow the gap. With Smith throwing to teammate Ed McCaffrey for 28 yards, and then again for two yards and a touchdown, the Cardinal tied the score with a two-point conversion. But Ismail then delivered a crushing blow, running back the ensuing kickoff 66 yards to the 16-yard line. Johnson went the final yard to make the score 21 to 14 and Notre Dame's opportunistic defense took it from there. Junior safety Greg Davis recovered a fumble in front of the Irish bench after a Stanford pass completion to end the next threat. And even though Notre Dame came up empty on a fourth down play from the Stanford five, the field position paid dividends. The Irish came right back to advance 38 yards to the Cardinal two where Craig Hendrick converted a 20-yard field goal for a 24-14 edge. In between late field goals by each team, Pat Terrell intercepted a pair of passes to keep Stanford at bay. His second pickoff with a minute left marked the last of Smith's 68 throws, most ever by Stanford and the most against Notre Dame. Smith's 39 completions also were the most ever allowed by the Irish but they weren't enough to keep Notre Dame's winning streak and number one ranking from remaining intact. A week later in Colorado Springs, Notre Dame played its fifth road game of a season that wasn't even half over. It was billed as the Battle of the Unbeatens, top-ranked Notre Dame against 6-0 and 17th-ranked Air Force. It was billed as a battle of Heisman Trophy candidate quarterbacks, with D. Dowis and Tony Rice matching offensive wits. It was billed as a battle between an Irish defense permitting 93 rushing yards a game and a Falcon offense leading the nation at 449 rushing yards per contest. And the largest crowd in Falcon Stadium history turned out to see it. If only Notre Dame's defenders had known how it would turn out. Well, coming into the week, uh, you know, we, we knew what to expect from Air Force. Uh, they run the wishbone, they run it well, they're very disciplined. Dallas executes uh, great. Their, uh, their rushing game had, had, had really been uh, uh, proven, and you know, we, we wanted to come in, and we felt we could shut them down. Um, the first half, we did that. In the second half, things changed a little bit. In the second half, they came out passing a little bit more than running. They hit the open zones in our defenses, and they scored a couple of times, but we made changes to compensate for that. Uh, if you would have told us before the game that D. Dallas was going to pass for 300 yards, we wouldn't have believed it. Quickly establishing its dominance in the trenches, Notre Dame needed five minutes and ten plays to negotiate 80 yards for its first score. A Tony Rice to Derek Brown pass for 24 yards and a Ricky Waters run for 25 did most of the damage.
After three Air Force runs and a punt, the Irish did it again. Using most of the rest of the period in 14 plays, they traveled 69 yards, with Waters' rush making it 14-0. By the end of the period, Notre Dame had had the football for nearly 13 minutes, while accumulating 11 first downs and 154 yards, compared to 0 and 11 for Air Force. When Ragib Ismail ran a punt back 56 yards, one play into the second period, the Irish had a lead they would never lose. Here's the punt. End over end. The Rockets going to take it at the 45. On to the 50, 45, 40, look out. 35, 30, 25, look out, 20. Man to beat 10, 5, all the way. Touchdown. But Notre Dame's big lead created a philosophy change by the home team that caught everyone off guard. While the Irish kept the Falcon attack in tow, Dallas made sure the Air Force offense lived up to its name. First, he found Greg Johnson on a 61-yard scoring play. After Rice located Anthony Johnson for 27 yards and seven more points for the Irish, Dallas bounced back with a 26-yard throw to Steve Sen to make it 28 to 14. But a Dallas fumble with less than three minutes in the half set up the Irish on the Falcon 35. On the fifth play, Ismail skirted the left end for an easy 24-yard scoring romp. Air Force moved into Notre Dame territory on each of its first three second-half possessions, only to lose the football on all three occasions. First, the Falcons came up empty on a fourth down play from the Irish 44. Next, sophomore defensive end Devon McDonald latched onto a Dallas fumble at the Irish 39. Finally, Todd Light intercepted a fourth down Dallas pass in the end zone as the Falcons came away with no points after having first and goal at the seventh. In the meantime, Tony Rice served as the architect of a pair of 50-yard drives that led to Craig Hendrick field goals. And that proved to be enough of a margin to withstand two fourth period scores by Air Force, the first rushing touchdowns permitted by Notre Dame this season. Behind Ismail's 180 all-purpose yards, Rice's 193 total offense yards, plus 96 rushing yards from Waters, the Irish nearly doubled the 168 rushing yards managed by Air Force. At 6-0 after its 41-27 win, Notre Dame could finally leave its traveling bags in the closet for a while. With visions of friendly Notre Dame Stadium dancing in their heads, the Fighting Irish returned home for a month-long stay. And Lou Holtz and the Notre Dame players weren't the only ones preparing for four straight home games. Ninth-ranked USC did everything it could to try to spoil the Notre Dame homecoming. But just when the number one ranking, the 18-game overall winning streak, and the three-year perfect record in Notre Dame Stadium appeared to be headed down the drain, the Irish got just what they needed from reliable quarterback Tony Rice. You know, we knew it was going to be a really tough game. You know, it seemed like a lot of teams that were in Chicago just love to play them, and that was one of those teams that we've been playing for a long time. Plus, it was my third year playing against them also, and... I just want to go out in style and just go out there and perform and try to play to my ability. And just by looking at the game situation, it seemed like we was down for a while in the first half, but the second half, we knew exactly what we have to do and just go out there and have a good time doing it and want to make things happen and get the ball into the end zone. The Sporting News ranked it as the most exciting college football game of the year. It surely ranked as one of the more impressive Irish comebacks in memory. But it started quite uncharacteristically with ace returner Ragib Ismail fumbling the opening kickoff. From there, USC's Todd Marinovich needed eight plays to get into the end zone, throwing to Larry Wallace for 12 yards and six points. 
That would be just the first of what seemed like dozens of changes in momentum. What Ismail gave away to open the game, he got right back, returning the ensuing kickoff 58 yards to the USC 38. From there, Tony Rice needed seven plays to get into the end zone, dragging Trojan safety Cleveland Coulter there himself. Rod West in at a tight end spot now on the left side. So double tight end, I can't have handoff to Anthony Johnson. No, Rice has got it. Down to the five, down to the goal line. Touchdown! What a great fake by Tony Rice. The Irish held USC on its next possession. But 20 mile per hour winds made fielding punts a dangerous game, as Ismail found out deep in his own territory. This time, Marinovich required only two plays, hitting John Jackson for one of his 14 receptions that totaled 200 yards. Pat Terrell personally halted another Trojan charge, and Duan Francisco did the same midway through the second period. But only strong defensive plays by Stan Smigala and junior tackle Bob Dahl enabled Notre Dame's defense to hang tough inside its 20 and force a USC field goal that made it 17 to seven at intermission. Notre Dame rebounded immediately to start the third period. Taking over at midfield after a USC punt, the Irish got a key gain by Rice on fourth and three from the Trojan 33. Two plays later, Waters took a pitch for six to cut the deficit to 17 to 14. The Irish turned the ball over twice more in the third period, with a lost fumble starting USC at the Notre Dame 20. Marinovich worked his way to first and goal at the seven, but on third down, Todd Light intercepted in the end zone and started the Irish on their way. Culminating an impressive 80-yard drive was a 35-yard scamper by Anthony Johnson. Johnson, the fullback. Here is Anthony Johnson in the open, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Anthony Johnson. On a quick opener, Anthony Johnson off the right side, 35 yards for a touchdown. But the lead was short-lived. A fifth Irish mistake. This one, a fumble at their own 34, put the Trojans in business again. Marinovich needed just four plays to put USC back on top 24 to 21 with nine minutes left in the game. But Notre Dame wasn't done yet. Battling to his own 45, Rice completed possibly the biggest pass of Notre Dame's season. A 40-yarder to Ismail, who caught it in stride and took it to the 15. The very next play, Rice option to the left side for what proved to be the game-winning points. Tony Rice runs the option left. Rice looking to cut in, down to the 10, he's down to the 5, he's at the end zone, touchdown Irish! 15-yard run by Tony Rice. Notre Dame goes 80 yards in 8 plays and leads 27-24. to 24. Marinovich, who finished with a USC record 33 completions and 55 attempts, for 333 yards, took one last shot. But three straight pass plays into the end zone from the Notre Dame seven were rejected by the defense, and the win streak remained intact. In another bend but never break performance, the Irish did what was necessary to win. In the meantime, they managed 266 crucial rushing yards, 197 of them after halftime, against a Trojan defense that ranked first nationally in rushing defense while giving up just 36 yards per game. In a series that has seen more than its share of classic confrontations, there was another one to add to the list. If the experts thought Notre Dame might not have much left emotionally or physically after that win over USC, they were dead wrong. Playing perhaps their most impressive all-around game of the season against a team that had given the Irish fits in recent years, they completely dominated a Pittsburgh team that came off an open date unbeaten in six games and ranked seventh nationally. Going into the Pittsburgh game, it was kind of a different game for me because my brother played at Pittsburgh and I'm from the Pittsburgh area so I knew a lot of the players. Uh, it wasn't really hard for me to get up for the game at all and we knew going into the game that we hadn't played very well against them in the previous years defensively and that you know even coming into this game they were even better offensively than they had been in the past so there's no doubt that we came into this game with something to prove but it was pittsburgh that did the proving to open the ball game 
Taking the opening kickoff and marching 68 yards, redshirt freshman quarterback Alex Van Pelt capped off the drive with an eight-yard pass to Ronald Redman for an early 7-0 advantage. Then it was all Notre Dame from there. The Irish played field position with a punt, pushing the Panthers back to their own seven. Three plays later, Van Pelt went to the turf in the end zone for a safety. Backed up on their four the next time, the Panthers punted it out to their 36. Notre Dame needed only seven running plays to punch it back in. Rodney Culver notched the touchdown, and Tony Rice added a two-point conversion. The Irish defense provided the next big play, with Pat Terrell grabbing a Van Pelt pass and bringing it back 54 yards through the entire Pittsburgh team. The statistics were nearly even at halftime, but Notre Dame flat out dominated the second half on both ends of the field. The Irish converted three pit turnovers into touchdowns after the intermission en route to what turned out to be an easy victory. First, Scott Kolkowski stripped Van Pelt and Notre Dame converted twice on fourth down. Culver from the nine and Waters from the one. After Van Pelt misfired on fourth down from the Notre Dame 39, the Irish got a 50-yard sprint from Ismail on the second play. Crochet, hand off to Rocket, 50, down to the 45, 40, race on the sideline, he's gone, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown Notre Dame. When Dewan Francisco intercepted and returned 41 yards late in the third period, the Irish required but six plays to make it 38 to 7. A final interception, this one by Jim Thorpe Award finalist Todd Light, set up a final back-breaking 80-yard drive by the Notre Dame Reserves. Thanks to Don Grimm's 17 tackles, plus 10 from junior defensive end Andre Jones, Notre Dame limited Pitt to 117 rushing yards, while gaining 310 themselves, against a Panther defense that had been permitting 92 yards per game. It marked a record-tying eighth straight win against teams in the top 20, and it marked the worst Pittsburgh defeat in 18 years. Notre Dame had come ever so close to blanking opponents during the Lou Holtz era, 10 times holding teams to a touchdown or less. But even that wasn't good enough to satisfy Notre Dame's all-star junior nose tackle Chris Zorich, who ended up one of the four finalists for the Lombardi Award. Oh, that's a whole strategy as a defense is to not let anybody score. And against Navy, we finally had that done. And I mean, all the players were just elated and everything else. The 41-0 victory over the midshipmen enabled Notre Dame to reach a couple of milestones. The win marked the 150th in Lou Holtz's career, and it also enabled the Irish to tie their record 21-game winning streak set back in the 1940s. It came in typical Notre Dame fashion, with a dominating rushing attack and an overpowering defense. Whatever pretense Navy held out for victory might have ended on Notre Dame's first play from scrimmage. Ricky Waters burst up the middle, set the stage for the Irish rushing show and a six-yard scoring run by Tony Rice behind Rodney Culver got Notre Dame off to a quick start. Big plays kept the Notre Dame engine purring smoothly. Ragib Ismail's 30-yard gain set up the second Irish touchdown. And Waters, who ended up with a career-high 134 rushing yards, galloped for 52 to make it 21 to nothing. When the midshipmen proved pesky enough to come near the goal line, Pat Terrell and his teammates took care of the problem. The Irish offense kept this half of the bargain in the second half, with freshman Rick Meyer and Dorsey Levins keeping the pressure on. But it was the defense that made life particularly miserable for Navy. Jeff Alm and freshman defensive end Eric Simeon each forced Navy fumbles, and unanimous All-America cornerback Todd Light added another interception to his total. 
The middies were limited to 166 total yards compared to 506 for the home team. Notre Dame's 414 rushing yards marked its most in 16 seasons. The closest Navy came to scoring was when it reached the Notre Dame 34, and even Chris Zorich had a smile about that one as the Irish blanked an opponent for the first time since 1983. It may take a few years to sink in, but Notre Dame's 1989 victory over SMU won't soon be forgotten by the Fighting Irish players who played a part in it. For one, the game marked Notre Dame's 22nd straight win, breaking the all-time Irish record established by Frank Leahy's teams from 1946 through 48. Maybe just as impressively, it marked the last home appearance for Notre Dame seniors. It enabled them to finish a third straight season without losing at home, while the 88th consecutive sellout crowd of more than 59,000 fans looked on. I think coming out of the tunnel was a big deal to all us seniors. I mean, it was a special moment for all of us, not only it being our last home game, but it'd be the last time we'd be together as a team. And I think uh, we're a part of something really special and winning one national championship and coming one game away from winning another one. And it was just a great feeling to be a part of it. You don't, you don't ever really forget the first time you came out of the tunnel. And uh, being at the last time, especially with the fifth year seniors and the other seniors on the team, and coming out of there and really feeling the unity of uh, your classmates and the alumni that come back and you know, knowing people are watching it on TV, it's a real dynamic uh, atmosphere. and It's full of spirit. It's uh, something I'll always remember. Once the Irish got going, they left no doubt what the final verdict would be. Tying an all-time Notre Dame record with 35 points in the second period, they scored in nearly every conceivable fashion. Included in the 59-6 win was a safety when SMU's punter stepped out of the end zone and a two-point conversion when Andre Jones ran back an SMU point after attempt that was blocked by freshman linebacker Nick Smith. Though the final score wasn't close, it was an afternoon of memories for the 28 seniors in uniform for the final time in their home stadium. While veterans like Anthony Johnson were more than used to crossing the goal line, it was a whole new experience for seniors Pete Graham and Rod West, who scored their first career touchdowns against the Mustangs. The Irish utilized 92 players in all, with an interception by senior walk-on Doug DiOrio in the final minute, capping off a day to remember for him and his fellow seniors. Seniors Brian Flannery and Dewan Francisco contributed earlier interceptions while the defense shut off the SMU running game, limiting the visitors to minus seven rushing yards. The record-setting home finale featured an all-time longest punt return of 97 yards by Ricky Waters. That helped pave the way for a special moment for Lou Holtz and his captains in the post-game locker room as the Irish enjoyed a brief celebration of their history-making 22nd consecutive victory. On behalf of your players and your coaching staff, we'd like to uh, honor Coach Holtz for going down in the history, as one of the, in the history of Notre Dame, as probably one of the greatest coaches, if not the greatest coach of the modern era. Uh, this is just a milestone and a winning streak that's going to continue for many more years, Coach. So, like, you know. yeah! 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 
Four times in the decade of the 80s, Notre Dame had traveled to frigid Beaver Stadium in search of a victory over Penn State. And each time, the Fighting Irish had been denied. Three of those defeats had come by four points or less. But nonetheless, the home of the Nittany Lions had been anything but friendly to Irish fans during the decade. With the chilly, gusty conditions making passing the football difficult, the Irish entered State College in 1989, knowing the running game would prove all important. It would be particularly challenging against a Penn State defense ranked first in the nation in scoring defense, giving up just nine points a game. But it was a challenge the Notre Dame offensive linemen relished. From the beginning of the season, we knew that we had the capability of being an explosive offensive unit. It was all a matter of putting everything together, carrying out the assignments, and doing what the coaching staff had in store for us to do throughout the, the whole season. And in the Penn State game, we played virtually air free ball, which uh, consequently put us in a position where we could execute the way we were supposed to. Not surprisingly, the 17th ranked Nittany Lions played with great emotion early in their home finale, and they scored on each of their first two possessions to take a 10 to 7 lead. But Penn State should have known what was in store after the very first play from scrimmage. Tony Rice scooted 24 yards in a draw play up the middle, and that proved typical of what the Irish would do to Penn State's defense all day long. Behind by a field goal, Notre Dame stayed with its bread and butter. First, Rice skirted left end for 17 yards. Then Waters headed the same direction for 19 more. Four plays later, Waters' dash to the flag gave the Irish a lead they would not relinquish. Lot to the right. Here's the fake and the handoff and coming around the right side is Waters. Ten. Waters down to the five, the three, the one, into the end zone. Touchdown! After Stan Smigala made a key stop on Penn State's Blair Thomas, the Irish were off and running. Rice, who had finished fourth in the Heisman Trophy voting, did complete a pass connecting with Ragib Ismail on first down. But Notre Dame kept it on the ground the rest of the way, with Anthony Johnson finally getting the six points on fourth down. The second half was much the same story. When Smigala recovered a fumble deep in Penn State territory on the Lions' first possession, the Irish wasted no time converting. Rice backed his way in on third down from the one. Penn State wasn't ready to fold yet, but Notre Dame's running attack was simply relentless. With Rice gaining a career-high 141 yards, Waters 128, and Ismail 84, the Irish finished with an astounding 425 yards on the ground. That marked the most ever given up by a Penn State team in the history of the school. Fittingly, CBS Sports named the Irish offensive line as MVP of the game, as seniors Grunhard, Brown, Brennan, junior center Mike Helt, and junior guard Tim Ryan manhandled a Penn State defense that had been permitting only 104 rushing yards per game. With visions of the warm weather finale against Miami in the Orange Bowl now officially permitted, the Irish could turn their sights to the Hurricanes. The challenge was clear to all. It was a matchup that needed no hype. Number one Notre Dame versus once beaten Miami. No one needed to add any more. Winless in the Orange Bowl since 1977, the Irish had hopes of ending that jinx the same way they had done the trick in Beaver Stadium. There was just one problem. The seventh ranked Hurricanes had other plans. Thanks to four or five key plays that all went Miami's way, Dennis Erickson's club did what no other team had been able to do for two seasons. They beat Notre Dame. And they did it with a bone-crunching defense and a patient offense that took only what the Irish gave it. In preparation for the Miami game, I, I believe our team and our coaching staff was confident that we would go down Miami and we could come away with a victory. As it turned out, I think we played the worst football game that we have in the past two years here at Notre Dame. And it just so happens on that very day, Miami played the very best game of their season. Along with the crowd noise and I think the weather a little bit and the fact that Miami is probably one of the best teams in the country, uh, and ended up as our only blemish on our 13-game schedule this season. And it was only at the very end, after a long and difficult road, 
do we fall prey to probably the, one of the best teams in the country. Miami didn't dominate the Irish as much as it did all the things it had to do to win. Notre Dame held the Hurricanes to a respectable 305 total yards. But a couple of huge passing plays had as much to do with the Irish undoing as anything else. After grabbing a 3-0 edge on their first possession, the Hurricanes made big play number one just before the end of the first period on a bomb from Craig Erickson to Dale Dawkins. But with All-America quarterback Tony Rice both running and throwing, the Irish fought back. They drove impressively to first and goal at the one until a tough stand by the home team forced Notre Dame to settle for a field goal by junior kicker Billy Hackett. With its defense finding the key to Erickson's success, Notre Dame doggedly hung tough. And when Ned Volkar picked off a pass and showed his hurdling form and tying the score, the Irish faithful wakened. Three wide receivers right, Erickson back to throw, dumps it over the middle, picks off Volkar, 45, Volkar to the 40, 35, 30, 25, 20, down to the 50, down to the 10, down to the 5, touchdown Notre Dame! With Notre Dame in position to add to its point total in the final moments of the half, Miami turned the tables. A Bernard Clark interception set up a hurricane score just 13 seconds before intermission, making it 17 to 10. But the Irish weren't finished. On Miami's first possession of the third period, freshman tackle Eric Jones' sack prompted a fumble that Devon McDonald nearly recovered for Notre Dame. Now backed up to their own three and seemingly needing a miracle on third and 43, the Hurricanes got just that. The back-breaking completion to Randall Hill took some steam out of the Irish defense and turned out to be the keynote play in a 22-play touchdown drive that lasted nearly 11 minutes. Notre Dame's last shot came on an 87-yard march that began at its own five. Once inside the 10, the Miami defense stiffened. Forced to go for six on fourth down, the Irish came up empty, and Miami then used up most of the clock while marching to a final field goal. The amazing 23-game streak against unparalleled opposition was history. But for consensus All-American Chris Zorich and his teammates, redemption and a return trip to the Orange Bowl were little more than a month away. Notre Dame's postseason matchup with top-ranked Colorado brought back a variety of bowl game memories for fighting Irish fans. Notre Dame would be playing in the Orange Bowl Classic for the first time since a win over top-ranked Alabama in 1975. Continuing another Irish tradition, Notre Dame was poised to take on the number one team in the land in a postseason game for the seventh time since 1969. In fact, the Irish had claimed national championships by virtue of their 24-23 triumph over top-ranked Alabama in the 73 Sugar Bowl and their convincing 38-10 romp over number one Texas in the Cotton Bowl in 1977. All those history-making wins were simply pages in a scrapbook for the 89 Notre Dame team. These Irish were more interested in making history of their own and their mission was to do it amidst a hectic week of palm trees, media appearances, sun and fun. For some teams, bowl games were a pleasant reward at a warm weather site for a season of accomplishment. But there was so much more at stake for Notre Dame in 1989. The Irish Orange Bowl challenge was no different than those they had faced all year long. To prove themselves all over again, 
in one more football game against the best that college football could offer. Going into Colorado game, there are three factors that we needed, we needed to concentrate upon. One was the fact that we still had a chance to win a national championship. You know, we played the toughest schedule throughout the course of the year, and Colorado being number one was the best way for us to prove that we had the best team. Two was the fact that just the seniors didn't want to go out losers, period. Three was the fact that we knew that for the University of Notre Dame, we had to come out and dominate. Coach Oates told us that if this game was important because we needed to reset the Notre Dame standard. And we went out there and I feel that most of us believe we accomplished that. This time it was unbeaten Colorado that stood in the way of the Irish. And the Buffaloes, in the midst of a storybook season, were on a mission of their own. With everyone else needing an Irish win over Colorado to keep the national championship up for grabs, Lou Holtz's team ironically even earned the cheers of Miami Hurricane fans. But once game time came around, the sun in front of Miami gave way to some fierce football, especially the defensive sort. Both sides had their first half opportunities in front of a record Orange Bowl crowd, but neither team ended up with much to show for them. Although the Notre Dame defense made its presence felt immediately, Colorado managed to move the football early. But the luck of the Irish was anywhere but with the Buffaloes. The Big 8 champions appeared on the verge of snatching a lead. But with Eric Bieniemy in the clear deep in Irish territory, a leprechaun knocked the ball loose as the Buffalo back was changing hands. On the next series, usually dependable kicker Ken Culbertson pulled a chip shot field goal attempt far to the left after Colorado had reached the Notre Dame five. Colorado's final first half possession showcased a momentum shifting goal line stand, one of the most impressive ones Irish coach Lou Holtz could recall. After the Buffs had rumbled impressively to first and goal at the Irish one, Dewan Francisco single-handedly repelled the enemy on first down. Darian Hagen tried to sneak his way into the end zone to no avail. Then he misfired on a pitch out. On fourth down, the buff selected to pass up a chance for three points. Here comes the snap, the spot, the pass by Campbell. Gonna run it. Well, Campbell down to the end zone. Stop at the one yard line. The defensive surge seemed to ignite the dormant Irish offense. Moving from its own one in the final three minutes of the half, Notre Dame benefited from big gainers by Tony Rice and consensus All-American flanker turned tailback Ragib Ismail. A nifty catch by senior split end Pat Eilers drove the Irish into field goal range. But after three successive timeouts, Colorado rose up to block Billy Hackett's attempt from 27 yards out. That left the teams tied at 0-0 at halftime for the first time in the Orange Bowl since 1938. But the momentum generated by the goal line stand and the late offensive awakening seemed to carry over for Notre Dame after intermission. On third and 11, Rice tossed to sophomore Tony Smith for 27 yards. Then Anthony Johnson added 29 of his own. Two plays later, Johnson put the first points of the evening on the scoreboard as the Irish needed just over three minutes to negotiate the 69 yards. Colorado had suffered only 13 turnovers all season, but the next one it committed proved deadly. On the third play after Notre Dame's touchdown, Ned Bolkar got his fingertips on a Darian Hagen pass that finally ended up back in his hands at the Colorado 46. The Irish quickly dug a hole for themselves as successive penalties made it first and 32 back in the Notre Dame end of the field. Rice found Eilers once for 18 yards. Then on third and 14, Ragib Ismail streaked down the Irish sideline for a 14-0 lead. Ismail's performance earned him the MVP award from NBC Sports and proved especially timely considering Ricky Waters' role was reduced to that of cheerleader after an injury on the third play of the game. Darian Hagen had some magic of his own up his sleeve 
as his touchdown scamper kept the Buffaloes in range. But after an exchange of punts, the Irish embarked on a nine-minute drive that both typified Notre Dame's relentless running game and ended whatever hopes remained for a Colorado national championship. The heroes were many for the Irish. Rice guided Notre Dame flawlessly as the Irish controlled the football for nearly 20 of 30 minutes while taking command in the second half. And it was the Notre Dame defense that held a Colorado team that had been averaging 473 yards and 41 points per game to just 282 yards in a single touchdown. Lou Holtz had told his Irish players at intermission that how they reacted in the second half would determine their approach to things the rest of their lives. He wasn't disappointed, and neither were the fans of the Fighting Irish. Once the clock had run out on the 1989 season, the final tally was an impressive one. Twelve victories for the second straight season. Wins over champions of the Big Ten, the Big Eight, the Pac-10, and the ACC. Twelve straight weeks as the unbeaten number one team. An all-time record win streak of 23 straight games. And an Orange Bowl win over the number one ranked team. One, two, one, two, three. But Notre Dame's football season comprised far more than statistics and records. The Fighting Irish earned the respect of the college football world as they risked their unbeaten record in number one ranking week after week in emotional confrontations against the most talented teams in the nation. I remember this team as a group of unappreciated winners. It was a group of young men that played the game not to please the fans or the news media the television commentators. It was a group who played a game because they really and truly loved the game and they loved one another. It was obvious we had outstanding senior leadership, we had a closeness, but yet at the same time we had a group of people who were completely dedicated to seeing this season to a successful conclusion. This football team had more adversity than any I've ever been around, yet they didn't cause a single bit of it themselves. They never complained, they never made excuses, they just went out and probably accomplished as much as any football team I've ever been associated with. We've often said it isn't what you do, it's what you had to overcome in order to do it. That's why I think I look back on the 1989 season and say that this football team was a group of overachievers and maybe the best I've ever been associated with.